can now move on to cost of capital. So what is the weighted average cost of capital? It is the return that the company needs in order to fully compensate the debt and equity providers. So in other words, it is the cost to finance the company. It is the minimum return that the company must make so that they can compensate the debt and equity providers. If they have a return that is less than the WAC, then they won't have enough money available to fully compensate the debt and equity providers. So companies need to have a return that is higher than the WAC because that's how companies will then grow in the future. Because if the return that the company is making is higher than the WAC, it means that they've got enough money available to pay back their debt and equity providers and there's still money left in the company for investment purposes so that the company can grow in the future. So the WAC is actually the minimum return that the company must make. And why do we need to know what the weighted average cost of capital of a company is? We use the weighted average cost of capital for capital investment appraisal. So if we have a long-term investment decision or long-term capital budgets that we are looking at and we are trying to determine whether a company should invest in a long-term investment or not, we need to know the weighted average cost of capital for the company. And we should only invest if the return is going to exceed the weighted average cost of capital. Because if the return on a certain project is less than the weighted average cost of capital, then it means the company won't have enough money to fully compensate the debt and equity providers. So the WAC is used for capital investment appraisal. The WAC is also used for valuations. If we are required to perform a valuation using the free cash flow method, we need to know what the WAC of the company is. Also, if we are looking at the performance of a manager and we are trying to evaluate their performance using the economic value added method, we also need to know what the weighted average cost of capital is for the company. Right, so there are various different uses and that's why it's important that you are able to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Now, I have already touched on this with you, but just remember, the cost of capital for the company is the mirror image of the return that is required by the investor. You'll remember I already said to you, the shareholder's required rate of return is if we are looking at it from the shareholder's perspective. If we look at it from the company's perspective, the terminology just changes and it becomes the cost of equity instead of the shareholder's required rate of return. But it's the same thing because the dividends paid by the company will be equal to the dividends that are received by the investor. So we just have different terminology depending on whose perspective we look at it from. But the return that the investor requires is equal to the cost of equity for the company. All right, because obviously also the interest that is paid by the company will equal the interest that is received by the investor. All right. Now, before we can calculate the weighted average cost of capital for a company, we first need to know what their cost of equity is, cost of preference shares, and cost of debt. Once we know the cost of the various different types of finance, we will then wrap this lecture up by calculating the weighted average cost of capital. So first, we are going to start with how the cost of equity can be calculated. And you can either calculate the cost of equity using Gordon's dividend growth model or the capital asset pricing model. So let's start with Gordon's dividend growth model. Now using Gordon's dividend growth model, we can calculate the present value or the market value of equity by taking the future expected dividend, dividing by the cost of equity less growth in perpetuity. So please note, that is always growth in perpetuity. Now, what will happen in questions is either they will give you the cost of equity, and if you are given the cost of equity, you'll be required to calculate the present value, or they will give you the present value, and in that case, you'll be required to calculate the cost of equity. Now, this is exactly the same formula. We are just restating the formula depending on what you need to calculate. If you are required to calculate the present value or the market value of equity, you take the future expected dividend, you divide by the cost of equity, less growth. On the other hand, if we restate that formula, if you are required to calculate the cost of equity, we take the future expected dividend and we divide by the present value and then we add growth. 
So please make sure you know those formulas or make sure you know how to use the one to restate it and to calculate the other, but you must know those formulas. That's very important. So just below you can see I told you if you are given the market value or the present value, you are then going to have to calculate the cost of equity. Or if you are given the cost of equity, you are then going to have to calculate the market value. Now guys, obviously in this lecture we are looking at the calculation of cost of capital. So you are always going to have to calculate the cost of equity unless it's been given to you. Because we can't calculate the weighted average cost of capital unless we know the cost of equity. The whole purpose behind this calculation is we need to know what the cost of equity is. So we can then eventually use that to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. So you will always need to calculate the cost of equity. However, you won't always need to calculate the present value. It depends on the required. Now, we are going to address this at the end of the lecture, so it will make more sense when we actually get to the end of the lecture, and I cover this with you at the end of the lecture. But for now, it's just important for you to know, don't waste valuable time performing calculations that won't be necessary. So you should only ever calculate market values, or you should only ever calculate this present value over here, if the target capital structure of the company is not given, or if the required specifically tells you to use market values when calculating the WAC. But like I said, I don't want you to stress about this right now. This will make more sense when you're actually studying, when you come back to your lecture notes and you're studying later and you've covered this already, then this will make more sense. But you'll see when we get to the WAC calculations at the end of this lecture, then this principle will make more sense. So for now, I just want you to know that you will always have to calculate the cost of equity. If we have to calculate the WAC, you must have the cost of equity unless it's given to you. And in some situations, you will be required to have the market value as well. But in other situations, you won't necessarily need the market value. All right, let's go and look at our lecture examples. You'll see with all of the lecture examples at the top, I tell you why the lecture example is important. So this lecture example is important because it shows you how to calculate the cost of equity if the market value has been given. So Drogo Limited recently paid a dividend of 5 Rand per share, which is expected to grow by 6% indefinitely. So guys, if they recently paid a dividend of 5 Rand per share, that is going to be D0. And in our formula, because that is the dividend that was just paid, all right? In our formula, if we are trying to calculate the cost of equity, we need D1, which is the future expected dividend. So you're going to have to take D0, the 5 Rand per share, and you're going to have to grow that by 6% in order to get D1, because it's always the future expected dividend that you are using in your calculation. Just read the question carefully. Sometimes they do already give you the future expected dividend. So obviously if D1 is already given, then you shouldn't adjust for growth. Now, this is growth of 6% indefinitely, meaning it's growth in perpetuity. Forever and ever and ever, the shares will continue to grow or the dividend will continue to grow at 6%. So that is growth in perpetuity. The shares are currently trading at 40 Rand each. That is your present value or your market value. And you need to calculate the cost of equity. So we've been given the market value or the present value, and we are solving for the cost of equity. Very simple calculation. Slot in the market value. Add your growth of 6% in perpetuity that we have over there, and calculate the cost of equity. Now, the only difference in example 3.2 is I'm now requiring you to calculate the present value or the market value of equity when the cost of equity has been given. So in this example over here, Drogo Limited has 500,000 shares in issue, and they recently paid a dividend of 5 Rand per share. So once again, that is D0. It's not the future expected dividend. It's the dividend that they recently paid. The dividend is expected to grow by 6% indefinitely, so that's going to be G. That is my growth in perpetuity. The cost of equity was recently calculated at 19.25%, so you've been given the cost of equity, and you need to calculate the market value or the present value. 
Now you'll see I've included two different calculations over here depending on what you prefer. You can either perform this calculation in total or per share. It's totally up to you. You get exactly the same answer, so it really doesn't matter. Just make sure you are using the correct formula. We are solving for the present value. So we take the future expected dividend. So D0 is 5. Grow that by 6% to get D1. Obviously, if you are performing the calculation in total, you need to multiply it by the number of shares in issue so that you have the total dividend. We then divide by the cost of equity less growth, and you get your market value or your present value. Obviously, if you are performing the calculation per share, that is going to give you the market value per share. You then need to multiply by the number of shares to get the market value in total. Now, you've seen two examples. One where we had to calculate the cost of equity, one where we had to calculate the present value. So you can see both calculations. Now, the reason why this is important is you need to understand this principle. Where the future expected dividend is used in this calculation, that jumps back one year and it gives me a present value today. You'll see now why this is so important. So when I use the dividend for year one, for next year, if I use next year's dividend in my calculation, that gives me a value today. So the theory over here is this jumps back one year. If I use next year's dividend in the calculation, it gives me a value today. It jumps back one year. You'll see why that's important now. You guys can then look at the next example on your own. I want you to go to example 3.4, please. So in this example, we still have Drogo Limited has 500,000 shares in issue. They recently paid a dividend of 5 Rand per share. So once again, that is D0. The shareholder's required rate of return is 19.25%. So if that is the shareholder's required rate of return, that is going to be the cost of equity. The directors believe that dividends will grow by 10% for the next three years, and then by 6% indefinitely. So over here, where we have consistent growth in perpetuity, that is going to be G. However, we don't just have consistent growth in perpetuity. For the first three years, the dividend is going to grow by 10%, and then only after that do we have consistent growth in perpetuity. So that's why this example is important. It deals with a situation where you don't have consistent growth in perpetuity. And in this example, you are required to calculate the market value of equity. Now, guys, this is extremely important. Gordon's dividend growth model can only be used where you have consistent growth in perpetuity. So when the dividends start growing by 6% indefinitely, then we can use Gordon's dividend growth model. But for the first three years where we don't have consistent growth in perpetuity, we can't use Gordon's dividend growth model. For the first three years, we are going to have to look at these dividends separately because we have inconsistent growth. But it's a very simple calculation. You're going to calculate the dividend in year one, the dividend in year two, and the dividend in year three. Obviously, the dividend in year one is going to be calculated by taking the current dividend now, which is five rand per share. You're going to have to grow that by 10% to get the future expected dividend, or D1, because this is currently, obviously, D0. So take D0, increase it by 10% to get D1, or next year's dividend, and multiply it by the 500,000 shares in issue so that you get the total dividend. So there's the calculation just below. That is the dividend in year one. In year two, that dividend is going to grow by 10%. So take that dividend, grow it by 10% to get the dividend for year two. This 10% growth rate continues for the next three years. So in year three, take the dividend from year two, increase it by 10% to get your dividend for year three. So where you've got inconsistent growth, you deal with those three years separately. Calculate the dividend for year one, year two, and year three. 
Now we have consistent growth in perpetuity because after year three, the dividend is going to grow by 6% indefinitely. So now we can use Gordon's dividend growth model in order to calculate a value because now we have consistent growth in perpetuity. All right. However, please note when you perform this calculation, you are not using D1. This is D1. This is D2. That's D3. Dividend in year one, dividend in year two, dividend in year three. We've already dealt with those dividends. So we now start this calculation with the dividend for year four. So you take the dividend from year three, and that is going to increase by 6%, not 10%. After the next, or from year four onwards, it's going to grow by 6% indefinitely. So take the dividend for year three, increase it by 6%. Divide by the cost of equity less growth. The cost of equity or the shareholders required rate of return was 19.25% and growth in perpetuity is 6%. Now, this is the logic that I was just dealing with where I told you this jumps back one year. In the previous example, we had D1 in our formula. And when we use D1 in the formula or next year's dividend, it jumped back one year to give me a value today. So now when I use D4 in my formula, that also jumps back one year and it gives me a value in year three. It jumps back one year. So this is not the value today. That is the value in year three, which is why you add it to your dividend for year three. If I'm using... D4 in this calculation, it jumps back one year and it gives me a value in year three. That is an extremely important principle for you to understand. So it goes into year three. You then total all of these cash flows. Input all of those cash flows into your financial calculator and using the cost of equity as your discount rate, calculate the market value or the net present cost. So you are just present valuing all of these cash flows so that you can get a value today. That's all you're doing. You're present valuing all of these so that you get your value today. And you've then answered the required. You've then calculated the market value of equity. All right, guys, in all of the previous examples, I gave you the growth rate. We knew, for example, that growth was 6% in perpetuity. If the growth rate has not been given, you are required to calculate the growth rate. So in example 3.5, we look at a situation where you need to calculate the growth rate when you've been provided with the return on investment and the percentage of earnings not paid out as a dividend. So please work through that example. It's a very simple example. Make sure that you can calculate the growth rate. In example 3.6, you are also required to calculate the growth rate, but this is when you've been provided with historical dividends and earnings. And in example 3.7, you also need to calculate a growth rate, but this is when you've been provided with the anticipated growth rates and probabilities. So please work through all of those examples and make sure that you can calculate a growth rate if it is not provided.